Assalamualaikum. Good morning to the participants in Malaysia and good evening to the guests who are joining us from the United States. My name is Azahar Abu Hassan Shari. Assalamualaikum. I apologize. We have some technical difficulties. We will back very soon. Sincerely apologize. Okay, my name is Azaha Abu Hassan Shari, and I would like to thank you very much for virtually joining the very first Pamike Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. I am joined by my respected colleague, Associate Professor Noor Azuki Yusuf, Dr. Atira, Ms. Inani, Mr. Arif, and Ms. Alia. It is our privilege and pleasure to welcome you today. Allow me to provide a brief introduction about Pamike, which can be translated as thinkers. It is a new initiative established by the Faculty of Language Studies and Human Development at University of Malaysia, Kelantan. The main goal of Permitir is to promote global peace and human well being by actively engaging in meaningful discussion with scholars and leaders around the world. And through the Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series, local and international world class scholars will be invited to share their expertise best working experience and leadership in the area of global justice promotion. In today's session, we will have the opportunity to learn more about the latest developments in the intersectionality of social identity and social rejection in the United States. For this, it is my honor to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Ohiro Oni Esele, the Assistant Dean for Program Development and Community Engagement at Adelphi University, New York, United States. In addition to his position as Assistant Dean, Dr. Oni Eseleh is also the Director of Hudson Valley Center of the School. Prior to entering academia, he held management position in healthcare organization and was instrumental in program development, creating and implementing policies and supporting the workforce of organization through training and interdepartmental collaborative work. When he became the director of the Hudson Valley Center of Adelphi School of Social Work in November 2015, he pledged to anchor his work on scholarship and community engagement. Since then, he has been instrumental in expanding the center to two campuses, and he is currently leading the effort to create another program at a neighboring county which would make the Hudson Valley Center three campuses with five programs under his direction. Dr. Oni Esela has a record of several other accomplishments, among which are creating a nonprofit management certificate program, which provides opportunities to train aspiring and mid-level managers, sourcing and obtaining funding to provide scholarship to students of this program, with special consideration for applicants of color, and obtaining scholarship funding for graduate social work students. Dr. Oni Esela is also an adjunct professor in Adelphi University School of Social Work. He considers teaching as an opportunity and a responsibility to affect others by shaping thought and contributing to their knowledge base. According to Dr. Oni Esela, teaching gives him an opportunity to guide and mentor students in learning what it means to be a professional social worker a respecter of diversity, human rights, and social justice, and how to develop appropriate professional judgment. Dr. Oni Eseleh is the author of multiple books, the first being In Pursuit of Dreams, The Truth About Immigration, which is probably the book by which he was best known until recently. He is the writer of the blog titled Rumination Blog, and his podcast is called Rumination with our hero Oni Eseleh. Recently, an article Dr. Oni Eseleh co-author has just been accepted for publication in the American Journal of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Dr. Oni Eseleh, it is a great honor to have you with us. Thank you very much. 
that's a very long um, uh, introduction, but I, I don't I don't think it's still um, speak the many achievements that Dr. Oni SLF uh, has been uh, achieved through, throughout his career. And next, we are going to um, briefly uh, explain about the tentative of this program. So as, as, uh, as for the agenda of uh, today's program, we will start with Dr. Oni SLF presentation, after which we, there will be a 20 minute Q&A uh, session. So during the Q&A session, feel free to write your question in the comment section on um, our faculty Facebook or in the chat, uh, chat box in Zoom. Okay, next, I will now hand over to Professor Pardasani. Thank you so much, Professor Pardasani, for being with us today, who is a Dean for Adelphi University School of Social Work, followed by Associate Professor Dr. Noor Azuki Yusuf, a Director for Permicare, to deliver the well, their welcoming address and remarks. It is a pleasure to give you the floor, Professor Pardasani. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Azaha Abu Hassan Shari. It is a pleasure to see you again in one week. We already met uh, a week ago, but it's a pleasure. And I know that you're an alumna of our School of Social Work. So it's a double a level of pride to see you and work with you. I want to thank you and your team at University Malaysia Kelantan for this wonderful series that you are, have developed. Um, yeah, I didn't know the meaning of the term Pemikir, and when you explained it about thinkers, I think that's what's so necessary um, in our social work field is to have people who are thinkers, innovators, creators. I want to thank Dr. Noor Azuki from the university as well for helping invite us and helping us be part of this collaboration. It's very, very <laughs> meaningful to us to be able to collaborate with, with your university, your students, your faculty, and your administrators. Um, I'll just speak a few minutes, and of course, I'll yield the floor back to Dr. Uzuki. Um, I wanted to say that uh, Adelphi University School of Social Work has been around for over 70 years here in New York. We're located over five different locations. We offer a bachelor's degree in social work, a master's degree in social work, and a PhD, a doctoral degree in social work. Our mission statement says that as a school of social work, we're committed to social justice and human rights, as well as we're committed to educating and training students to be social workers out there in the world not just ethical and effective social workers, but really warriors for social justice and change makers. And this topic of today's conversational lecture by Dr. Ohiro Oniesele is so critical across the world, not just everywhere else, but even in the United States, we every day struggle with the marginalization, the oppression and the othering of people that are different, of minorities, whether it's race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and so on. And the impact that has on people developing their identity, developing their place in the world is so critical. Not only are the clients of social work who represent diverse communities, including including those that are marginalized. But many of our students also represent communities that are marginalized or oppressed, but they come to social work as a chance to make a difference, not just in other people's lives, but in their own lives and benefit their communities. We are so lucky to have Dr. Ohiro Oni Esele as a part of the social work family. He's an incredible partner, collaborator, a wonderful scholar, as you will hear him speak today and about his work, but he's passionate and he makes social workers proud that he's one of our own. And I cannot tell you how excited I am that you've invited him today. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for collaborating with us and highlighting our scholars and our team members. So um, good morning to people in Malaysia. <laughs> Good evening to people here in the United States. Thank you.
Thank you, Thank and you. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum and greetings, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us to participate in our very first Pomike Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. Salute. And we are very proud to be able to virtually host it today from the Faculty of Language Study and Human Development. Just before we start our presentation today, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Dean of the Faculty of Language Studies and Human Development, uh, UMK, Dr. Borhan Cik Daud, and the Dean of the School of Social Work at Adelphi University, uh, Professor Manoj Pardasani, okay, for uh, your support toward the first Pemike Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. I also would like to extend a very special welcome to our presenter today, Dr. Ohiro Oni Esseleh, the Assistant Dean for Program Development and Engagement at the School of Social Work at Adelphi University, New York. Dr. Ohiro Oni Esseleh is a phenomenal scholar who will share his expertise, vast working experience and leadership in the topic of uh, eldering and marginalization of minorities, uh, synopsis of identity and social rejection in the United States. However, before I hand over this session to Dr. Ohiro, uh, <clears throat> I want to say once again, on behalf of the Pemike Unit Organization Committee, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to virtually see so many of you here. I hope you all enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Am I on now? Uh, you know, I like to start by saying that uh, when we talk about otherism and the otherism of people, it's a global phenomenon which is why my discussion is going to be based on really taking you on a journey around the world. But I like to also say that one of the things uh, missing from, my, from the introduction of me is the fact that I like to think of myself as a storyteller. Uh, even if some might think that my stories are either too long or too brief or really uh, a bit harmful to hear. But I think of myself as a storyteller very often because uh, I happen to believe that uh, stories and storytelling humanizes all of us. Uh, it humanizes us and breaks down barriers, reveals the humanity in all of us, and helps us to understand those things that we share in common, and also helps us to tell how we feel about being the subjects of otherism the victims of otherism and the objects of fear and social rejection. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you that I have a confession to make. Uh, when I hear, uh, whenever I'm introduced in an occasion like this, uh, introduced in the way that I was by uh, Dr. Azahashari, uh, there are multiple feelings that actually just descend on me and I'll just speak about two of them. Uh, one is, one has to do with a very strong sense of goodwill toward my parents who actually raised my siblings and me to understand and embrace our people regardless of where they came from and who they are and what they believed in. In other words, they raised us to be allergic to authorism. The other sense that I feel that very frequently when I'm introduced like this is some sense of depersonalization where I feel as if I'm observing myself from outside of my body as I wonder, hmm, did I really do all of that? But I will be remiss if I did not thank Dr. Nur Azuki for that, for actually being here and helping to put this together. And uh, also, I want to thank you very sincerely, uh, Dr. Abu Hassan Shari. It's so great to see you. And also, we had a few moments 
uh, when we reconnected at the beginning of this. And I'd like to thank your team at UMK for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Uh, you see, several years ago, I had the pleasure of spending some time with uh, Professor Chinua Achebe, who many people would know, because he was one of the best, um, one of the uh, world's best um, uh, uh, scholars. He was a novelist, a Nigerian born novelist, uh, who is now of blessed memory. In one of our times together, he described his meeting with James Baldwin the famous American novelist in 1964. And here's what Chinua told me. He said, I was in awe when I met him. And I think James Baldwin recognized that, but even if he didn't, I told him how much in awe of him I was. And James Baldwin said to me, as writers, we are brothers. So welcome, my brother. It doesn't matter where you're from, welcome. In the same vein, uh, as colleagues in the Academy of Scholars, I am delighted to meet you, Dr. Azuki, and your team from UMK, uh, because indeed, we are on the same journey together, not just to enlighten our world, but also to educate ourselves on the travails of the world and the ways of living and also to contribute our quarter, our time, our scholarship to making the world a better place. My very special thanks goes to my Dean, Dean Parasani, who you just heard from. It is our joint hope that this relationship that we are cultivating will be one that benefits not just our two countries or our two universities, but also extends to the world around. But I did tell you that I'm a storyteller. <laughs> oh, I'd like to think of myself as a storyteller. So I will tell you about a few people. One of them was a guy named Langston Hughes. And if you love poetry and music and so on, you probably know of Langston Hughes, an American born in Harlem in New York City, who lived from 1902 to 1967. He's a graduate of Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And a few years ago, I had the pleasure of uh, giving a keynote speak a keynote speech at a conference over there and just driving through the grounds of Lincoln University, I could not help but think about uh, Langston Hughes. One time Langston Hughes said, thinking of himself as a man who was born in the United States, a country that sold the idea, the concept of democracy around the world and still does. Langston Hughes couldn't help but remember and think about himself and think about his society and think about his people. By the way, he was an African-American. He said, I swear to the Lord Almighty, I really can't see why democracy means everybody but me. In other words, why would we sell democracy around the world and tell people that democracy is a government of the people, for the people and by the people? But the people who look like me in the United States are still in chains. We are authorized. How is that so? And then there was a guy called Kwame Nkrumah who came from Ghana, also to study at Lincoln University, the same university. Kwame Nkrumah became another Lincoln graduate. And on Saturdays, he would take the bus from Pennsylvania to uh, New York City to just watch the street talkers most of them Black in the United States, who were using language, the words, words, not guns, to fight for freedom of the people who looked like them. Fellow Americans were authorized in our great country. They used language, not weapons. So he learned from those street talkers and eventually he returned to Ghana and began to fight for his country's independence from Great Britain. An experience that perhaps those of you in Malaysia might understand because you two were colonized by the Dutch and then later by the British. And of course, the British colonization of Malaysia actually lasted longer than any other kind of colonization that you experienced. And one time sitting across the table from the Britons, as he talked about trying to get independence for Ghana, he said to the British, the only Briton I trust is a dead one. That's how enraged he was. 
by his experience of otherism and the otherism of his people. Then when the British wondered if Ghanaians could handle their freedom, if granted freedom, which is what every oppressor says about the oppressed, can you really handle your freedom? The dominant group always says that. Kwame Nkrumah said, we Africans, just like you, have a right to misrule ourselves. So do people who are authorized also have a right to live freely just like the rest of us? But very little about the stories that I have just told you is about these two men. None of them even knew the other. But they had one common denominator, their skin color. There were two individuals from two different countries who were treated in their own countries as if they did not belong. One by British colonialists who invaded and took over his country and treated the owners of the land in classic authorizing norms. And one was being authorized in his own country by his fellow Americans. Therefore, if democracy, I ask you, my friends, if democracy is real, and if it is indeed a government of the people for the people by the people, and if it does indeed promote equity and humaneness and equality, as is usually the claim, why is it that COVID-19 has revealed the extensive inequities in democratic as well as autocratic systems around the world. Inequities that I would argue are indeed likely produced by the tendencies of human societies toward authorism. It is not an accident, I, I think, that on Tuesday night here in the United States, and it is Wednesday for you in Malaysia and Wednesday in Ghana, Nigeria and the UK and in India where some people are, and these countries where people are joining us from tonight. It cannot be an accident we have, that we have come together by way of Malaysia to discuss some of the most crucial matters about human life, identity, acceptance and social rejection. After all, we are connected, even if we may not always embrace that connectedness, but why? Against this background, what I intend to do today is to take us on a journey around the world as quickly as I can, as I ask and seek to plant some nuggets in our minds and to answer questions about who and what we are, what we do, and perhaps why? Why, how did we form these identities and what new identities are we creating through authorism? You see, Jorge Capitillo Ponce asserted that defining the other has been a struggle throughout human history. As if to suggest that scholars and societies have expended an incredible amount of energy, time and effort on this task and that the other has been an elusive find. That is a claim that I reject wholeheartedly unless we stipulate that a struggle to define the other lies in man's unwillingness to accept the realities that gaze so fixedly at us. While most discussions about the other have often focused on identifying characteristics such as race, ethnicity, and gender, much discussion also needs to be had on the prospects of identity developed around and shaped by the category of the other. Therefore, what I will do tonight is to frame this lecture around three theories. And I urge you to follow how I describe the theories and then keep the theories in mind throughout this delivery because of their immense relevance to our discussion of the impact of authorism, identity, and social rejection. And I'll put these theories up for you uh, just to look at. So 
they, the first of these theories is Erickson's psychosocial stages. The reality is that the early identity theorists are impressive for the quality of thought that they brought to bear on the study of identity, a subject that remains so complex. To my mind, Erickson established the value of identity by, identity by asserting that identity provides a sense of well being, a sense of comfort in one's body, a sense of direction regarding one's life, and some confidence in the idea that you matter to me and that I matter to you. His work on identity development and formation is crucial, even in trying to understand the connections between identity and social rejection. In Erickson's formulation, as I understand it, identity begins to develop prior to adolescence when a child recognizes that he or she is separate from their parents. That is the point when a child engages in the task of picking admirable qualities from each parent. As this phase ends, a child moves into adolescence where the main task is identity formation. In other words, Identity formation begins where identity development ends. At this stage, the child begins to take on his or her own characteristics. This process requires the child to negotiate a developmental task and associated conflict of identity versus role confusion. Identity is being formed and it, there is a conflict between that identity formation and role confusion, which Erickson says is the main task of adolescence. In this state, individuals question their own self-perceptions and how others perceive of them. For a moment, I urge you to just consider what the process of negotiating this phase could mean for a child from a marginalized group, especially one who lacks strong support systems who lack strong protective factors and socially appropriate guidance. Young adulthood, which Erickson puts at age 20 to 39, comes to the development task of intimacy versus isolation. And it's a time when individuals are focused on developing and consolidating their personal goals, particularly in the areas of career and family. That is also the time when people are negotiating society and they are looking for jobs and trying to develop families and getting doors slammed in their faces because they are authorized. The groups from which they come are considered inferior. Therefore, they are inferior regardless of the educational credentials that they may have. So, the demands of this phase brings individuals to closer contact with the world and raises new issues and raise new issues for many young adults. With more exposure comes more challenges, including for many people from marginalized groups, elements of social rejection that they may experience as they navigate new challenges of career development, family, and expanded social interactions. So I also want you to take a look at this as I go into the discussion of the next theory, which is social identity theory. But uh, first of all, just watch this. Which doll is the black doll? And which one is the white doll? That one. Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, what, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? 
Yeah, which one looks like you? Um, that one. Okay. I hope you noticed that the children who we are saying this and the checkers game where grandson and granddad will bother. The, the children who we are saying that the doll that looked like them was ugly. In other words, they were ugly. And the white doll was the beautiful one. We're all black. Because social identity theory focuses on a person's awareness that he or she belongs to a specific social category or group. The theory suggests a somewhat predictive journey. An individual undergoes a self-comparison process by which he or she categorizes others who are like themselves. When that individual categorizes them with self, that becomes his or her group. In other words, I recognize people who look like me. Therefore, that is the group that I belong to. I know it because they look like me. So that when society tells me that a group that looks like me is bad and ugly, it means that I am bad and ugly. I take it in. I believe it. That becomes my identity. It frames and shapes my identity. And what I end up becoming has already been predicted. Unless, of course, there are interventions that come from basic factors, protective factors, and all those social supports that many may not have. So persons that are perceived to be different from the self then make up the out group. People who look, like, who look like me, act like me, are in the in group and everyone else is in the out group. The impact of this social comparison process on an individual self-esteem is enhanced by evaluating the in group and out group using standards that lead the in group to be judged negatively. The doll experiment that I just showed you was actually one that was used by Dr. Kenneth Clark when he argued the separate but equal case, Plessy versus Ferguson, in the United States, separate but equal case uh, to make sure uh, that our schools were desegregated, were, um, desegregated in the United States in 1954. As you saw in that experiment, African-American children who have undergone the social comparison process which we worked are aware of the social group that they belong to and of the negative judgment of their in-group. Each of them therefore selects a white dog who doesn't look like them because their group is considered bad. The other group is considered a symbol of, of beauty. And that is the preferable doll. So in a very heterogeneous society, therefore, such as the United States and some other countries, black versus white, Muslim versus Christian, gay versus straight, men versus woman, each has a more or less privilege, opportunities, and levels of social acceptability. Studies have shown that group identification influences the view of the self as an extension of the group. I am black, so I represent everyone who is black in the United States. That is how I am judged until there is some exposure or some expression of the ideals of contact theory that says when you get to know people, perhaps you begin to see them differently. So studies have shown that group identification influences all of that. But this may partly explain why even when society considers a group status to be relatively low, in-group members maintain commitment to the group without any desire to leave it, even if they could, because that is where they feel safer and a feel that the people who look like them 
act like them, know them, are the people that will protect them. Therefore, while a dominant society may tend at times to blame the oppressed for self-categorization without seeming to realize that this is a universal process, the reality is that the social categories in which individuals place themselves exist as part of a structured society and only in relation to other contrasting categories. I live in, uh, I live in public housing projects. Why? Is it because that's where I choose to live? Or is it because I live in a system that is so structured that that's the only, and designed, that that is the only place that I can live? I hang out with people who look like me. I walk into a cafeteria, I sit with people who look like me. Is that because that's my choice or is it because that is how society is designed? Therefore, in the United States Congress, for example, there might be no black congressional caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus or the Congressional Caucus uh, of Women's Issues, except that for a very long time in our history, the structure of Congress gave the impression of a white man's club, or in other words, a white man's congressional caucus. So the last theory that I would like to expose you to is the theory of intersectionality. Well, for some, for some reason, I'm not able to share it. And I'm not able to share that PowerPoint. But since Crenshaw introduced intersectionality theory to explain the interconnectedness of gender, race, and class, the theory has been expanded and applied to several conditions, including social identities, power dynamics, legal and political systems, and oppressive structures in the United States, and of course, in other countries as well. One of the lessons of the broad application of intersectionality theory is that even beyond the geographical boundaries within and for which it was initially conceived, is that intersectionality of power and marginalization cuts across artificial borders. Therefore, it is important for us to discuss authorism and everything that comes with it beyond a single national border. Clearly, we may yet find many more intersectionalities across the broad spectrum of human existence. And this is because no single application of intersectionality can completely grasp the range of intersectional powers and social problems with which our societies wrestle. I am Ohiro Onyesele. I am a doctor because I have a PhD. I am in that class but I'm also a man and I'm also a black person who has to prove himself that not only does he have all of this, he can actually perform to show that he earned them. Where the person who looks like him and has even less credentials doesn't have to. But the point of intersectionality is that I cut across all of those categories. And that is a fact that is so for everyone, even for people who don't belong in the class to which I belong. Whether we're discussing concepts of classism and racism and sexism, all of which are in fact the other, they have to also be considered within the concept of their relationship with all these other categories sexism, classism, and racism, what is it like for a black successful woman who belongs in a one class, but is also still black and is also still genderized so that he doesn't earn as much income as a white woman or a white woman who also is genderized because she's a woman and authorized therefore and does not earn the same income and in the United States and it's only 86 cents to a dollar for a white man. You see, Bob Nash argues that intersectionality theory represents a more complex way 
of theorizing identity, and he doesn't buy it because he argues that it reveals the racial variations that exist within gender, as well as the gender variations that exist within race. Therefore, it should not be a good way to actually take a look and have a discussion about issues of gender and sex and so on. You see, it is not my goal to take on Nash. I will not take on his critic because that's not my goal. But my goal is to focus on the value of this theory, some of which even Nash acknowledges. Because for a long time, intersectionality was used only in relation to its original formulation. But as I have just described, it can be looked at in so many different ways. Therefore, if we understand what intersectionality is about, and in applying this theory, we will then understand also the fact that people are authorized, not just on the basis of race, but also on the basis of gender and on the basis of all of these other isms that we know of, and all of which cut across the identities of each person and each of us sitting here. Therefore, it is to, to my mind that to that extent, the intersectionality of identity and social rejection is right, very right for discussion. And that is what we are doing tonight. But how did we get here? I really wish I could share this PowerPoint with you, but it's just not. OK, all right, so. So how did we get here? The famous British physical anthropologist Samuel George Martin was the one who claimed through his research so what I'm trying to show you is that scholarship has been used over and over and over again to actually authorize people. Even as we think that scholarship is meant not just to rescue people, but to make society better. So the British, this British anthropologist used his own scholarship to claim that he could tell the intellectual capacity of any race of people by measuring the, in, the interior of their skull. Therefore, he said, if you were Caucasian, your skull size was this size, therefore you were more intelligent than anyone who was from Asia, anyone who was from Africa, anyone who was not European. To my mind, that scholarship, as well as others produced by people like him, are instructive in helping to understand the long history of others. Mind you, this man died in 1851, which tells you for how long otherism has been with us. We do not even need to go far back in history to see how scholarship has been used to authorize, authorize individuals and groups in our world. Because as society has evolved and scholars have engaged in series of studies and policies aimed at increasing understanding of human existence and human nature, of which identity is part, the classifications of people into categories have also evolved in multiple directions. In many cases, scholarship produced by Pat Moynihan, for example, in the United States, in his 1965 work on poverty, which he attributed as its function of single parenthood, is significant. And so also it is a scholarship of the molecular biologist uh, who won a Nobel Prize, um, Dr. James Watson, who argued that it's an error of social policy that anyone will think that Africans are as intelligent as white people. And it was just in 1995, not that long ago, when Dr. Murray, with his bell curve scholarship, funded by the Heritage Foundation argued that black people had lower IQ than white people. And that has been used over and over again by people of his political ilk to argue that, you know, it is important for us to have policies that really discriminate against people. 
that kind of scholarship has been used to justify policies that have affected perceptions of individual and group identities, especially in relation to members of oppressed and marginalized groups. In its application, the author conveys implied messages of strangeness and social rejection, two factors that very often define the minority experience and gives rise to fear. So whether I expressed or not, we don't even have to argue that authorism exists. And we don't even, and even when we agree that there is authorism, and I don't know any reasonable person who wouldn't argue that we authorize people. But whether, but in its application and in its discussion, and whether authorism is expressed or not, and policies are defined as policies based on authorism. One thing that we must recognize is that all wars that have ever been fought, all wars, by none, that have ever been fought have been fought against the other. And in doing so, man has always defined the other as the other. We fight against them because they're not us. We authorize them, therefore it becomes easier to fight against them. Whether it was the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo in the 1990s, or whether it was in Rwanda, and whether it was any war before that, people were authorized. And people were labeled very often before we went to war against them, even if it was the Iraq war. We would label people and stigmatize them because once you label people and stigmatize them, it becomes easy to justify why you are doing that. Therefore, it is important to consider the fact that everyone that's ever labeled or stigmatized was first considered as the other, so that a label and our stigmatization could be legitimized, if not by order of law, but at least in tradition, custom, or in our minds. Just for emphasis, my point is that every labeled or stigmatized individual or group has always been placed in the category of the other, so that the labeling or stigmatization could be rationalized and maintained. Having been so categorized, therefore, the other becomes a stranger, even if he or she is the neighbor next door, a fellow citizen, or an individual or group in far distant proximity, who we have never met and may never have a chance of meeting. Therefore, although some of us have never been to China and have never personally related with some Chinese, with anyone of Chinese descent, during the, COVID, during the height of the pandemic in the United States, all Chinese began to be perceived by a segment of our society as the other, and they were stigmatized as carriers of the coronavirus because China was labeled by our political leaders in the language of the vision. So the virus was called the Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus, and all of those terms that further authorized people who did not look like us. Even in Nigeria, where I was born and raised, the other categorization is constantly expanding starting, of course, at a point of distinction between the Northern and Southern Nigeria. Parts of Nigeria are so designated simply because of the confluence of two rivers, the Niger and the, and the Benue. In nearly every aspect of the country's functioning, the North-South dichotomy is not only at play, but one is reminded of it constantly. Therefore, to Northerners, Southerners are the order. And to Southerners, the reverse is also true. And of course, this reality pertains across ethnic and religious lines throughout Africa. In Brazil, where a segment of the society is relegated to life in the favelas, and where skin color continues to expand and limit opportunities for people, one does not even need to explore extensively to find who the society considers as the other. In the United States, Battles we have fought against school desegregation. And we have many adults today who from elementary school through university education, we are never in class with someone who did not look like them. 
So when we recall that there were times in our nation's history when science geopolitical displays that said, there is vacancy, but Irish need not apply. No dogs, no Negroes, no Mexicans, we serve whites only, no Spanish and Mexicans, Christians only, Jews not allowed. Then we begin to see more clearly how patently the author has been defined throughout the course of history. So if you ask me then, who is the other? I will tell you what I think, that the other is someone that we know. The other is one whom society has either intentionally or unintentionally marginalized or made a stranger. And we continue to make them strangers. Because after all, it is easier to dehumanize a stranger and render him beneath the acceptable standards determined by the dominant group based on one or a combination of factors, such as race, gender, class, sexual orientation, <coughs> religion, age, language, immigration status. And let me explain though that by dominant group, which is a term that I think I have used a few times already, I do not mean dominance in terms of population. Although that is one of the characteristics that underlie and feed dominance. Instead, I am using dominance in relation to power. The history of apartheid in South Africa reminds us that population is not always synonymous with power because the population of South Africa is about 80% black and 9% white, yet, and of course, that's the definition of apartheid, it was the white people who were dominant over the black people because they had the power. That experience of South Africa should be a reminder to all of us that in every discussion of oppression, which is what the concepts of otherness, strangers, labeling and stigma connote, dominance is always located where the power is. So by relegating individuals and groups to the status of other, the tendency is to promote the idea that others have contributed very little or nothing to the, to the nation, to whatever country we are in, and that our countries can do without them because they are completely irrelevant. An accurate review of the history of the United States will tell you that that is not true because even the White House in the United States was built by slaves. I would argue that the order is in fact a social construct, although it has a very long history. And the quantity and psychosocial impact of the identities that have resulted from such construct cannot be overemphasized. It seems to me that related to this construct of the order is the separation promotion and maintenance of the identities of ethnic groups, whose members, even in diaspora, may seem polite to one another when they are in public, but they nevertheless have a consciousness of otherness. Which is why, for example, it doesn't matter what part of the world I run into someone who, like me, was born in Nigeria. We exchange pleasantries, and the next question is, what part of Nigeria are you from? Because otherism and the otherness, those concepts, those terms, those practices are inbuilt in the human psyche in every society. And when you see a guy who is British and interacting with a guy who is French, and this is something that I have experienced firsthand, the discussion is polite until one of them leaves. And then you hear times from them about the other. And these are facts. So why should we care? We need to care because the world is currently experiencing social problems at an alarming spite. Most adults might not recall a time when the world was in a crisis such as we now face. And at no time in modern history have there been as many co-occurring intergroup and international conflicts as there are today. Actions and reactions driven by racism, 
anger, heterosexism, religion, gender bias, and other forms of bigotry not only suggest poor, and in some cases non-existent in the group relationships, but also suggest a declining interest in relationship building. Therefore, people and groups and even nations have retreated to perpetual silos, knowing increasingly less about one another, resulting in avoidable conflicts and multiplications of the other. But what drives those negative realities? I am sure, trust me, I believe that there are many factors that we can spend the next week exploring. Nevertheless, for the purposes of the present lecture, the more relevant questions are probably the following. What should we as students and scholars be paying attention to? What should leaders from community to national levels know? about the importance of shunning authorizing tendencies. Let me answer the questions by saying this, that on a micro level, when individuals feel marginalized by societies that they perceive as having no interest in their social groups or in themselves as individuals, they either, in, they either disengage or lash out against the society that is authorizing them. So we know enough now to know that most of the acts of terrorism in Europe, especially France and Belgium, and the countries around them, and the crisis in Nigeria's Niger Delta and in Northeastern Nigeria and many other parts of the world, and even discussions of minority status, even in Malaysia and other parts of the world, actually have their roots in this idea that people feel authorized. And so acts of terrorism in many of the countries that I have just mentioned have frequently been perpetrated and we know now more than we did that those acts are perpetrated by people who saw no place for them and chose to lash out at society due to a belief that they and others like them had been relegated to the most inferior corners of society within, with no hope for their future and no place to turn. So whether the discussion is about George Floyd in the United States and other police killings that I'm sure you see on television in Malaysia and for those of you joining us from other countries, you see on television in the countries. And whether it's about discrimination in or that in European countries and the United Kingdom or the treatment of minority racial, ethnic and religious groups in Asian countries uh, and again, including Malaysia. An understanding of the factors that lead to these phenomena should be of benefit to all of us who are interested in closing the window on conflict and developing much improved societies. For behavioral scientists like me, who work with individuals, families, and groups susceptible to fear and social rejection due to their marginalized status, this work should also contribute toward our understanding of the plight of those people and thereby enhance our ability to help them overcome their struggles. If you ask me what a danger is, or what one of the biggest dangers is, it is actually what results from authorism and where that leads us to. And that is where my interest in exploring, in researching and writing about social rejection is actually founded. Because social rejection to me refers to a situation in which a person or group is isolated from interacting with others in society. It is not that you separate them physically from society, but you authorize them through social policy and actions that make them understand and realize that they are not supposed to be interacting uh, with others in society because they are considered inferior. And there are multiple reasons why and how this happens, but on a group level, the seeds of social rejection are sown and nurtured through stigmatization which link and fill and describe as the co-occurrence of interrelated components of labeling, 
stereotype in separating status loss and discrimination. Every act of group stigmatization arises out of a desire of a dominant group to establish, exercise, and maintain its dominance over less powerful or marginalized groups. And it doesn't matter what country this is happening. The elements of stigmatization include negative labeling, social separation of groups, establishment of social disadvantage, and not allowing equal as access, even for people who are not asking for equality, but just equity and an opportunity to have a level playing field. The resulting stigma produces and is propelled by blame and prejudice against the stigmatized groups manifested in words, actions, policies. In other words, social stigma involves attribution of negative characteristics to a person, group, or group based on features that others perceived as undesirable. And because we consider them as undesirable, we make them the objects of fear. We become afraid of them sometimes because our political leaders say we should. So some scholars have found in their studies that rejection motivates people to distance themselves from the sources of rejection and brings them closer to those who are accepting just as we saw in social identity theory. So when this happens, several other possibilities are also known to occur. Among other things, the individual grows in a sense of belonging and loyalty to the accepting group and further away from the dominant group. In that context, the sense of commitment to national identity diminishes and fear and distrust are enhanced. In that context, it seems to me, and I believe this to be the case, a sense of commitment to uh, you know, I believe that no society can expect to benefit eternally from, social reje from socially rejecting any groups that make up the society. Therefore, the relationships between nations and social groups characterized as the other deserve ongoing exploration. I am playing my part and I'm inviting you to do the same. And we should do that, the realities of the existence of in and out groups notwithstanding. Because all groups that make up a nation share some commonalities that distinguish their countries from other countries and other ethnic groups. So where does this take us? You see, it was not long ago when we believed, it wasn't long ago, really when we believed that our world had taken a different course and that increasing technological advances, we are breaking down geographical barriers. So we coined terms like uh, the global village, the cyberspace and chat room and all those high sounding terms, because we believe that we are coming together that became part of our daily lexicon for describing the interconnectedness and narrowing of differences and space that the new technologies are driving. Currently, it does not appear to me that there is still a great deal of hope that that is still the road in which our world is traveling. And this has happened because of a disintegration of the thought process that was fo the foundation upon which our hopes have been built. In that place, xenophobia has taken root. And we, who are students and scholars, must bring the world back from the brink through our scholarship. Hopelessness, helplessness, and legitimate fear have become prevalent as individuals and groups find ways to cope with the stigmatization and, set and sentiments of the new nationalism that seeks to maintain and create new other categories. Please permit me to place this in context because for a very long time we have known from studies that human nature would almost require us to do anything that we think might protect us from, the re from real or imagined or clearly perceived dangers. The other side of that is that out of a desire for the preservation of organized society, we under the requirement of law that precludes us from res 
from responding to fear in any extreme way, unless our lives are inarguably threatened, are also faced with a situation where what we see every day is that the same law that says to some of us, you must not respond unless your life is in danger, also says to other people in our society, no, you can respond any way you want, especially if the person that you consider to be dangerous is someone who does not look like the dominant. So I wonder where we go from there. I feel that to address the experience of fear and social rejection that marginalized groups and individuals face in our societies, societies must invest in liberal arts education. We must invest in the education of our citizenry around curricula that emphasize mutual acceptance and respect, as well as the history of the nation and people who inhabit it the history of all people, not the history of some. I believe that we must also encourage the ideals, the tenets of contact theory that tells us that it's important to actually interact and get to know other people who don't look like us. Because if we do, we'll get to know them better. And we may, by doing that, just begin to create a better world. I think that humanities should be emphasized in our school curricula and encouraging society from childhood. And our problem solving strategies should be taught in individual and group settings at all, at all levels of society. It is also important to assist members of marginalized groups in developing and strengthening their social support systems. We should push our leaders to use soft power to promote peace instead of war and educating the political electorate and office seekers who will eventually rule over us. And we need to be very active in rejecting every move towards social rejection of anybody or any group. We must work to ensure that policy is made and implemented by those who understand the intersectionalities of the constructs that I, have that I have discussed, among others, as well as the potential consequences of social rejection to any society. Finally, I believe that the implication of Goldberg and other studies act, because it finds that it is highly valuable for any society to consciously promote equality by addressing society's tendency to marginalize individuals and groups. I submit that by so doing, social rejection will be minimized and we will be on our way to live in a better world for the generations that come after us. This is my call to action, that through our scholarship and through our interactions with other people that we think today about those theories, Erickson's psychosocial uh, theories, the theory, social identity theory, intersectionality, because we are all part of the other. Therefore, through our scholarship, through our work, through our interactions with others in our society, let us begin the match toward the reduction of vulgarism so that we will live in a much better world, whether we are scholars or not. And at this point, I'd just like to say thank you very much again for giving me, for inviting me to do this. And I will be very happy to take any questions or hear your comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oni Sla, for an incredible, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, I was wondering what how do we train and prepare our social work students and other students who are going to be in helping professions, uh, not just social work, but any helping professions? How do we help them understand this process of othering, the impact of stigma, and how to 
assist people or facilitate people standing up together to fight this? Well, thank you very much, Dean, for the signing. Yeah, you know, that's a, a very important question. And when I, when I, I remember that when I have spoken to students at graduation, I have said to them, go back to the world now that, you're, now that you've graduated and you come into our university and we'll put you through some sort of a production loop. And it is my hope that as you've been through this system, you can now go out and let the world know that while you were a student here, you were in the same classroom with someone who came from a different race. You were in the same classroom uh, with someone who was of a different religion and who were with someone who, was, who, who, was, uh, who had a different sexual orientation and that you were not harmed. But I think the time to begin to send that message is when they come in at orientation uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one, because many people who come to university are coming to meet people very often for the first time who really don't look like them and don't believe like them and are very different from them in many ways. It is incumbent, therefore, on those of us who teach students to also very clearly, as much as possible, understand who we are and be open with our own positionality and also understand, because you cannot give what you don't have, you cannot teach what you have not experienced, and you cannot teach what you do not know. And I say, and I believe very strongly that it's important for us when we teach Erickson, uh, when we teach Sigmund Freud, when we teach Piaget, when we teach all of these theorists who lived in those days, that we try to do as I try to do tonight, to let everybody, all of our students who may not have, who may not look like Eric's indeed, who may not look uh, like as fraud did, that we help them to see themselves in those theories and how those theories apply to them. And when we do that, we can begin to get them to understand that they are not inferior to other people who are in class with them and help others who are in class with them begin to see that the theories also apply to people who didn't look like they and Erickson and they and Freud, but people who look like other people and therefore limit other, other, you know, otherism. But I think that in addition to that, we must be bold in teaching anti-racism, uh, white supremacy. And one of the things that, um, that we are to do, and for us to be able to do that, I think it's important to actually take a look at the curricula of our programs and really try to frame them around concepts that promote recognition of power and dominance and uh, superiority and uh, other, the other, you know, and everything that the other is about. And I must say that it's one of the reasons, uh, Dean Patasani, I, I think, uh, I know you wouldn't mind me putting you on this spot. I hope you don't, <laughs> you know, because we have many people here from many countries. Uh, one of the things that I have really admired uh, as in your tenure as Dean, which has just been a year as, uh, as our Dean, is, the, is your vision your vision to promote social work education in, in a way that embraces all, in a way that helps us and our students to see not just what our role is, but to see it as a calling to change that mindset that has helped some people to use scholarship to promote even otherism. And I think that that's what we should do. I hope I answered your question. Uh, I should, uh, Dr. Shari, do you want to read the questions or do you want me to just take the questions? I think you can. Um, which way are you comfortable, Dr. Omiru, Dr. Onyesele? We have three. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, do you want to, okay, I can, I don't mind, I can read them. Uh, do you want to, that's fine. I'll give the floor to you, Dr. Onyesele. 
Okay. Uh, one question says, um, do you think pride leads to prejudice? Or is it just stepping outside the social norms that makes us vulnerable to ostracism? How does inclusivity, uh, how uh, could inclusivity disengage such prejudice? That's, uh, those questions are a mouthful, and I'll take them one by one. Do you think pride leads to prejudice? I think that pride can lead to prejudice, to being prejudiced toward other people. Uh, because I think that the entire, I mean, pride can be founded on the idea that you have what others don't have, you're superior to others. So there is some narcissistic tendency within the expression of pride in its practical terms. Therefore, it can lead to being prejudiced or toward other people. Because if you teach a child, for example, that he or she is superior to everyone else, and that's what they believe, then when they interact with people who don't look like them, you are very likely going to see some elements of pride. And it can indeed lead to prejudice and therefore otherism. So, or the otherizing of people. And the second question, or you said, or is it just stepping outside the social norms that makes us vulnerable to ostracism? Stepping outside the social norms, well, I think the question that I have is what is stepping outside of the social norms? The social norms are defined by society. And when you step outside of them, that's not the only thing that leads you to be ostracized by society. Sometimes it is just these other elements that we've discussed tonight that lead to otherism that will lead an individual to be ostracized by society, not just because they stepped, aside, stepped out of, for, let me just give you an example. For example, uh, if I drove down the streets of a road close to my home, I haven't done anything wrong, but I could be stopped by a police officer just because of the way I look. Driving my car has now, I haven't stepped out of the social norms just because I'm driving my car. I haven't stepped out. But the fact that people who look like me could be ostracized from certain settings would be what propels the police officer to feel that they can stop me and treat me in whatever way he or she does. So it isn't just stepping out of the of the search. Then how does inclusivity disengage such prejudice? It really falls within what I was talking about, which is a contract, uh, the, the contact theory, which argues that if you actually interact with other people and open yourself to developing those interactions with people who may not look like you, and you get to know them and you get to know their humanity, you get to know that they're just like you. Uh, it can reduce uh, prejudice. It can reduce the tendency toward otherism. Uh, but some people would argue against contact theory by saying, doesn't that just, just put the onus then on someone who is already otherized? Why does it have to be they who let you into their circle for you to know and accept their humanity. But that's really not what the theory does. But however we look at it, it is still important to engage. And it is making contact with other people that can help to, to bridge gaps. And then uh, another question is, um, it, it says, um, let's see, are there any government policies focusing on diversity. In Malaysia, we have Keluarga, uh, Malaysia, Malaysian as one family before this one Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Azuki, yes, there are government policies that focus on diversity. Uh, I will tell you that we had, uh, we suffered a significant setback as a, as a nation um, in the four years prior to this. And it is that experience that has led to attacks on critical race theory as people lie about what it is. And I'm sure that some of you have seen that on our television uh, in Malaysia. 
And uh, yes, we have we have policies, for example, affirmative action and policies around that. Uh, we have we have like other policies like Title IX, Title VII, and so on, that make it safe for everyone to be able to interact, for example, in a workplace, and for people to get hired. Uh, so there are policies like that that uh, promote that focus on diversity. Some of them fail uh, in their applications. Uh, and by failing, I say, I just mean that they do not always achieve the intended results, not that they completely fail, or by failing sometimes it is the people, the people for whom it was intended are not the greatest beneficiaries. For example, affirmative action was meant to actually promote the uh, diversity by helping people who we are less privileged. But it is white women in the United States who have been the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action. And that's how small, it's really, it really depends on the, uh, the application. Uh, but yes, we do have those policies. And um, another question is, does religion play a role in authorism, positive or negative? And the big answer to that is yes. Uh, and uh, we know that in many countries, people are authorized. And when I use the Nigerian example, where I talked about a North-South dichotomy, uh, there is, and some of that is based on authorism, where Southern Christians consider the Northern Muslims as the other, and the Northern Muslims consider Southern Christians as the other. And religion can play a role and a very, very strong role because religion really speaks to the core of who we are. Therefore, when I think of culture as the core of our existence, I think about religion also within that context. And religion can be so strong and we can adhere to it so much that we feel that others who do not believe like us are the other. And that plays out every day in every country that claims to hold on to religion. Uh, I also have here, yeah, one of the ways I minister to the other is by identifying them with the absolute other. That is, I see the other, including myself, a male Latino who has readily experienced rejection, as intimately and ontologically connected with the divine. If memory serves me correct, Emmanuel Levinas argued that the, uh, that the Messiah was present in the face of the other, the stranger. Does acceptance of the divine means acceptance of the other? Do you think this is a cogent argument in dealing with otherness from a theological or religious perspective? Absolutely. Uh, because I think that if my own understanding of the Christian uh, scriptures uh, are correct, if my own understanding is correct, I, I think that um, there is actually a very strong discussion there of um, Christ saying, if you have not done so well to my brother, you haven't done well to me. So if you have not received my brother, you haven't received me. In other words, my brother is me. My brother is my face and represents me. And I think that you find that in so many religions, not just in Christian religion. And yes, uh, I believe that that's a very important and um, one, a very good, strong way to approach it from, uh, from that angle. And uh, another one is, Doctor, what new strategies can we use to address stigmatization and social rejection? Since a lot have been done in the past, but still the narrative has not changed. I have argued that there needs to be a change. There needs to be ch changes need to be made. Uh, such that these discussions are built into this, into what is taught in schools. Uh, people have to understand from when they are children that they are the other, the other is them. We are all the same. And um, in addition to teaching that in schools, there need to be discussions that happen at all levels. Very often we wait for national leaders to lead these conversations, but that's not what should happen. What I'm looking forward to is uh, the building of a strong relationship between our university at Delphi and UMK, 
So we continue to have discussions that bring us all together even closer. And uh, Dean Padasani is here and has told me that uh, as part, part of my portfolio as academic, as um, assistant dean for program development and community engagement, and this is his vision, that part of my role is to build partnerships, these partnerships with universities around the world. It doesn't matter where they exist. And what is that going to do? It will also foster this understanding and help us to build not just these relationships, but also help us to really see us as one with a mission to build a world that is stronger and embracing of people. And so I take on that challenge and I see this as one step in that direction. So therefore my response to that and the additional response to that is that we also hold policymakers responsible. And when hope also make us responsible, we ourselves should be responsible and there needs to be curriculum development that addresses these issues from childhood to adulthood. And that conversations like this need to be happening at all levels, not just at a national level, but at all levels. And the other question is how can we promote entrepreneurship with, with the other to bridge the gap? It takes one step you reach out. What tends to happen with businesses very often is this idea that if I, uh, this idea that collaboration may not be crucial because it might reduce the bottom line. That needs to go out of the window because organizations are stronger when they collaborate. And when you collaborate with organizations uh, that you may not even know, with companies that you may not even know, that you may not even like initially, you find that through that process of collaboration, you get to know each other better, that you build a stronger business model, and also that you are building a world that really embraces more people through business. And so if the question is how you can do this by embracing other businesses and thereby fostering a reduction in otherism, I think that collaboration is, is key to doing that. And you yourself must also consume research, consume research that helps you understand the dangers of tokenism in business and consume research that helps you understand how businesses can grow when they collaborate and when they interact with others. So let's see. Well, the, I think that this question is uh, really also an extension of that, and this is very important. Is there a model for quantifying the impact of orderism on corporate and national performance? I would say to you that I haven't seen that model. There may be, I haven't seen it, but I can explore it. And one of the reasons I, I, I would be hard pressed to find, I think it would be difficult to find some, uh, is that businesses, uh, you know, corporations have not always been great at promoting the reduction of orderism. Instead, corporations have actually been even better at promoting orderism. Uh, you know, so it will be very difficult to find models that quantify that impact. But I would say to you that I would say that's a research study that if you don't mind, and if you want us to talk after this, I'll be happy to join you in research in this, because I think it is research that I too will be happy uh, to read if it's not one that we can engage in. Because um, the, I will say that right now when there are discussions, for example, about um, trauma-informed leadership and uh, spiritual leadership in corporations, those kinds of research are really geared toward uh, well, I think that at some point, they are geared toward un uh, understanding leaders better, the human leader in the corporate environment. But I think at some point, they will run across and they will run into a recognition of authorism and how corporations can, um, can get through them. But this is a study that I will be happy not just to read, but also to work with you on.
Uh, and the question is, I wanted to know if Adelphi University has any intention to collaborate with any of the universities in Ghana. Uh, Dean Padasani, here is someone from Ghana who has joined us from Ghana and she, her question is, uh, is Adelphi University, does Adelphi University have any intention to collaborate with any of the universities in Ghana? I know it's my role, but, I'm, but, but I am really giving you this question. I'm pointing we, to you. We would love to. Um, the university as a, in general has multiple partnerships across the world at various schools and colleges. But I can definitely say that our vision in the School of Social Work is very global. You've heard uh, Dr. Ohiro speak today, but many of our faculty and even some of our students are focused on international work, international collaborative work. We think we can learn as much from other people and countries and cultures as much as we can share what we know with others as well. So I welcome it. Perhaps you could reach out to Ohiro as a, a, a person of contact and we could then discuss further. We would love to. Faculty, students, community, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Dean. Uh, and I, I realized that there's another part of that question that I just answered that I did not answer. Uh, because the question is also, is there a model for quantifying the impact of autism on national performance? Uh, the, I think uh, for a single model, I don't think there is. Uh, but I think that there are multiple aspects of national performance that people study, uh, you know, for, if, and, um, but that's really it. Dr. Oni Osele, we have uh, two more questions. Yes. Let me read this to you uh, this time. Uh, so the first question, uh, what new strategies can we use to address stigma stigmatization and social reduction since a lot have been done in the past, but still the narrative has not changed. So well, I think I answered that question, right? Okay. When I talked about uh, curriculum review and change, uh, holding ourselves and holding national leaders responsible and engaging from community, from basic community to national uh, levels and, um, and going through schools and from childhood to adulthood and so on, yes. I'm so sorry, I, I mixed up the question. This is the question, sorry. Okay. Uh, listening to this lecture tonight, I have a So this is the question, I apologize. Listening to this lecture tonight really brings to the light how diversity is more in words than deeds in nation like the United States. More than ever before, COVID-19 did disparity to light as it has historically affected the other. How can racial disparity be erased in healthcare? This is from a KT. How can racial disparities be what? Racial disparity can be erased in healthcare, Dr. Onis. How can it be erased in healthcare? I will be happy to sound a note of optimism, except that I cannot because I think I will be, um, I think I'll be deceiving myself if I believed that racial disparities uh, can be erased in healthcare because human beings are running uh, our healthcare systems. And there are significant healthcare disparities that are based on race and socioeconomics and uh, even in some cases, uh, immigration status. Uh, and I think that to completely erase uh, racial disparities in healthcare would mean completely erasing racism. And I am not, I'm not very hopeful. What I'm hopeful of is that it can get better. Uh, the reason is because we just went through the COVID pandemic where we were all exposed. Uh, the healthcare disparities, we are all there uh, for everyone to see. And so I know that there are strong attempts because 
once we recognized that, we are forced to recognize all of that. There have been strong attempts to make sure that that gap is breached, but whether or not it will be completely erased, I don't, I'm not very optimistic. And it's, and I talked about healthcare disparities, of, you know, that are based not just on race, but also on socioeconomics. And you will see that across the world, where people who have the money will get the best healthcare, and people who don't would not, even if they come from, even if they all look alike and come from the same country. And that's one of the thing, problems also with uh, the COVID-19 as it's been administered. If you look at most developing countries, the people who are actually getting the COVID-19 vaccine are people who have access to healthcare and other people are being left out even if they wanted the vaccine. And they are the people who are also more susceptible to messages that are anti-vac that are anti-vaccine um, because there is some comfort that comes from that, I guess. Dr. Adha, can I ask a question without writing in the chat? Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you Dr. Uh, Dr. for your sharing. I have one question, but I didn't write in chat because it seems too long for me to write. Uh, sometimes, uh, in my experience, sometimes we stumble upon someone that, that have a good intention or good or, good or without good intention to know our society. But along the way, they're using their own opinion, experience, understanding about otherism, maybe based on his or her society in order to understand our, uh, my society. So is there any way we can have a, we can meet in the middle or is there any mutual understanding about otherism between diverse society in our world? Because otherism in your society is might be different from mine, but we, we have such a different history, culture, background. So that's my question. Thank right, you. If, I, if I understand it clearly, uh, you're saying that the experiences of the other uh, in your society may be different from the experiences of the other in my society because people are different and societies are different. So is there a way when someone is speaking from their experience and saying, because I experienced this in that society, perhaps that's how people are generally in that society. That is their way to interpret that. Is that your question? Yeah. Right. Uh, it speaks really to one of the uh, uh, concepts that one of the ideas that we had discussed. Uh, and it also, for people who study what I study, who look at uh, these kinds of research, it is also one of the things that uh, some of them struggle with two questions. Number one, is it appropriate for me to say that I am authorizing people when my experience is based on a bad experience that I had with someone who came from that society, who came from that. But that's really what otherism is about, that when you go from an experience with one or a few to judge an entire society, and it doesn't matter where you live, that is one of the things that we need to shun when we have discussions about otherism. And so if part of your question then is what kinds of conversation do you need to have with people who feel like that? This, what you need to really, also really understand is that this work is not work that happens overnight and people are not going to change overnight. So what needs to happen is an ongoing conversation that helps people to realize that the experience that they had it does not really apply to an entire society because one person does not a whole society make. And uh, there's a question here that says, Professor Hero, are we fighting a losing battle with the authors of ordering? Since from all indications, they are fighting to keep others as order. Is it a losing battle? 
I don't think that bringing awareness to people, I don't think it's a battle we can lose. I think it's a battle that, I don't think it's a battle we can lose. I think it's a battle that we can win the awareness piece of it. But that question is actually predicated on two assumptions. Number one, uh, it is work that needs to happen, but it is hard work. Uh, and number two, since people are people, is there hope that we can ever change the minds of people? The answer to the first one I have already given, that it's work, it's hard work, it's long work, and we need to do it and continue to do it. But the second thing that is predicated on, uh, can we actually change the minds of people however much we try? To which I would say, we can change the minds of some people. We should not expect to change the whole world. Because I tell you that uh, it doesn't matter what, how big the problem is, so how big the situation is that we are experiencing. There are still people who say, we are in the midst of a pandemic, for example, but there are still people who say there is no pandemic, despite all evidence. And if you teach as I teach, that would be the definition of a delusion. When you believe something that is contrary to all evidence. So there will still always be people who believe that otherism was divinely ordained and otherism should reign supreme. Uh, but the reality is, are we going to stop the battle? And are we going to stop this discussion? It's really not a fight. It's, not a, it's just a discussion where we educate one another. And so to that question, I would say, we are not losing the battle of spreading awareness. Uh, because many people, I can tell you that when you saw my most recently published article on autism, um, there were many people who contacted me and said, I never thought of the other. This was the first time I even heard that word. So we are not losing the battle against autism. And I am asking all, everyone who is here tonight to actually start, continue to have, live here and have those discussions. Just go and have that discussion with one person about otherism, with one person. And if you do that, that will be 55 more people just from uh, tonight that you've had that conversation with. And then they will have that conversation with other people we need to spread that awareness. So by spreading that awareness, we are going to change minds, but will not change the minds of everybody. Dr. Oniasala, I have a question. Yes. Um, I put something in the chat regarding um, otherism within races, and I put detrimental. I meant instrumental. It's very, very important to have these conversations, but does your work look at otherism within races? Like regarding skin tone colors, you know, that's, that's a big deal right now. Well, it is very interesting because that is the, that's what you have just described is the concept of colorism. Yeah. And it is really big and there is otherism even within the black race. There's otherism among Asians, there's otherism among Europeans, as I mentioned before. There's otherism among Africans. Uh, there's others among Latinos. And so your question is, is there a way to discuss otherism with, that is in race otherism? And, and how, yes. much, how much does your work look at that? Is that something that you look at as one of the ages of how in depth this is really an issue? Right, in this discussion tonight, I mentioned it when I say that even within in groups, uh, and I use the example of Nigerians, for example, and I say we're from the same, we're born and raised in the same country, but when we meet within minutes, the question is what part of my, <laughs> seconds, oh, I'm a Nigerian, you're a Nigerian, and the next question is what part of Nigeria are you from? And then you are authorized. So, but, but to your question specifically, how much does my work look at that? Not yet. I, my work is not focused on colorism. 
it is focused on authorism, not on colorism, but I do agree very strongly. And the research on authorism, on authorism really can be, um, you know, it can actually be difficult to do because people within the same racial group are not going to easily acknowledge that they discriminate against light, against people who don't look as light as they are. Uh, but I will tell you that I have met some uh, some people who really experience strong authorism, and uh, it's a very painful thing when people who look like you authorize you because of your skin tone that doesn't look exactly like this, and we are both them both the same uh, racial come from the same racial background. But I do agree with you. My work hasn't focused on colorism. I don't know if it will, because for those, for scholars, you go where the research takes you. And so I don't know if it will ever go, I don't know if it will go there, but at Adelphi University, actually, we do have two professors whose work right now, uh, much of their work is focused on colorism, or some of their work. Uh, Dr. Kiros and Dr. Um, uh, Beverly Araujo Dawson, they are studying colorism. And they have actually written about it. Uh, so the last, well, I don't know if it's the last because I'm not uh, moderating, but one question here says, uh, uh, it's the most recent question, perhaps inclusive economic growth where every other is empowered financially and is independent could ameliorate authorism. Yes, thank you. Uh, because if we can lift but what we can do is we can reduce this, uh, we can reduce otherism because that's the question. Can it reduce it? It's not, can it eliminate it? It can reduce it, but in terms of eliminating it, I really don't think so because even among people who have the same amount of money, uh, very often there is still a discussion of behind the scenes of you know, and there are still meetings that some people are not invited to, even if they may have more money, just because of the way they look. So, but it will definitely, as if we have economic, you know, strategies that target the lifting of people uh, within the economic realms, yes, I believe that it will ameliorate terrorism. So next one, I think we have a few more minutes. It's, uh, attendees want to ask questions, share feedback or comments. I think... Dr. Ohiro, I think yes. uh, we arrived at the conclusion right now. First of all, thank you very much for your a very amazing, very insightful um, presentation. It was uh, really an eye-opening experience for me, and I would imagine it would it was the same for many of you attending uh, today's presentation. I mean, Dr. Ohiro, your presentation uh, provided a very clear understanding of the theories and basically holistic overview of the othering concept that leads to marginalization and other social injustice that people suffer, not only in the United States, but also around the world. So um, yeah, with that, I, on behalf of Amike or Tinkas uh, members, thank you so much. Thank you. and. Um... I can tell you how grateful I am. And um, I am glad that um, our Dean is here. And uh, I am sure that he will express to the rest of our university um, how grateful we are that we had this opportunity to dialogue tonight. And uh, we are going to move from here to, uh, to develop our partnership with your university and other universities around the world. And tonight we got that notice from Ghana and will pursue it. And um, I am more grateful than you know, because this is us connecting the world. 
and um, we will get the work done. Thank you so much. Thank you. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>